glad to have all of you here today. And as we do each week, we light the candle early because we can't get the thing to work later. <laughs> that is simply a, a symbol of the light of the Christ and the light of the world. And as, as Christ has said to us, you are now the light of the world. And so as we go from here today, go on out in the darkness and be the light that other people might see and find their way and find love that they know they need. We today at Welcome Bloom in the Desert, as ministries, we're committed to welcoming everyone, expressing our life together in the words of the United Church of Christ. Wherever you are and whoever you are and however you are in the journey of faith, you're welcome here. Even if you haven't started, you're still welcome. And we welcome all people, right where you are on the end, on this that great long line of types of people. We could name you. We could say you're man, man, foot, meat, all meal, whatever, whatever, whatever. And it doesn't really make any difference. And you can find out later. You can always ask different people around you. Now that we've been scattered in body and mind and spirit throughout the week, perhaps even this morning. So let us draw together in worship and let us bring our hearts and our minds and our souls and strength together as we receive our music for center. Please rise as you are able and join with me reading responsibly to the call to worship. As spring comes to a close and summer approaches and is here, new life is evident all its splendor. Growing as offspring of God, we become new creations as signs of the Spirit and seeds that grow into God's realm. Here and now, shalom, salam, ping on, God's peace, amen. This is the time in our worship when in faith we open our hearts to ministry. Now in prayer, we welcome the spiritual embrace of God that comes with openness and reconciliation. Dear God, you so often take for granted the magnificent abundance you continually pour into our lives. Sunshine, rain, shelter, food, family, friends, meaningful work, your presence. The blessings give our life meaning and joy, but we act as though we have earned them through our own merit. Forgive us, lead us from self-absorption. Forgive our blindness to how our acts affect our lives. We react quickly when others hurt us, and yet often refuse to accept responsibility for the far-reaching effects of our own decisions. Please move us from self-centeredness to being centered in you, that we may wisely balance our needs and the needs of others. Amen. Amen. <coughs> Loving Creator, wonderful Counselor, Sovereign of Peace, receive now our silent meditations and prayers. All of our silent prayers, let the people say, Amen. 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 God's love and grace are our reason and fuel for creating a new world, beginning with loving ourselves and culminating in service to others. Amen. Let us now receive the word. Today's Hebrew scripture reading comes to us from the book of Psalms 145, verses 10 through 18. All your creatures will praise you, Yahweh, and your holy people will bless you. They will tell of the glory of your reign and speak of your strength. You make known to all humankind your mighty acts and glorious splendor of your reign. Your reign is a reign for all the ages, and your dominion endures from generation to generation. You lift up those who are falling and raise up those who are oppressed. The eyes of all look to you in hope, and you give them their food in due season. You open your hand and satisfy the desire of every living thing. Yahweh, you are just in all your ways and loving toward all that you have created. You are near to all who call upon you, all who call upon you in truth. Here ends the reading from the book of Psalms. Today's epistle reading 
is Ephesians chapter 3, verses 14 through 21. That is why I kneel before Abba God, from whom every family in heaven and on earth takes its name. And I pray that God, out of the riches of divine glory, will strengthen you inwardly with power through faith, so that you, being rooted and grounded in love, will be able to grasp fully the breadth, length, height, and depth of Christ's love, and with all God's holy ones, experience this love that surpasses all understanding, so that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. To God, whose power now at work in us can do immeasurably more than we ask or imagine, to God be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus through all generations, world without end. Amen. Here ends the reading from Ephesians. Thanks be to God. Amen. Good morning, Blue. Good morning. Oh, it's wonderful to be here with you, and an honor and a pleasure to bring this sermon commentary, or as some people have said, the weekly rant. <laughs> in another church, I had a couple of men sit in the back say, well, there he goes again, and his friend would say, well, you can't stop him. So here I go again, and uh, hope you enjoy this time together we have. The letter comes to us in a letter to the Ephesians. And last week we had part of this letter also read, and there was a discussion between John Poole and Ron Lang as to whether or not Paul wrote this letter. And um, I'll leave that discussion to Ron and John as to whether or not Paul wrote it, because there's evidence in here that Paul wrote it, and then there are scholars that say Paul didn't write it, and then there's scholars that say that Paul did write it, and I just I don't want to get into that argument. But <clears throat> I'm on the side today that Paul did write it, because there's evidence in here of Paul's thinking and Paul's theology. Now, what does that mean? Did that mean Paul wrote it, or a student of Paul wrote it, or a person of Paul's school wrote it, or Paul's uh, study wrote it, or Paul's history? It doesn't matter. Paul's influence is here. Paul's thinking is here. Okay, are we okay with that? Yes. Whether or not Paul wrote it or not, it doesn't matter. Yeah, okay, we got it. Okay, because I don't want to have John and Ron get into any more arguments. <laughs> okay. Thank you very much. The reason I want to lift up Paul is that I know that uh, Rev Kev and a number of people have a problem with Paul. They think that Paul is so prejudiced, homophobic, um, know, against women's rights, against everybody's rights, and just he doesn't like anybody. And everybody hates Paul because Paul is not progressive enough for everybody in this contemporary society. And so everybody wants to write off Paul. Okay, I'll give you that. But you can't write off Paul completely, because if you write off Paul, none of you would be Christian. <laughs> None of you would be in the church. None of you would be here. If you write off Paul, Christianity would be a small sect of Judaism in the Middle East someplace, and probably forgotten now in the generations. If it hadn't been for Paul, Christianity would not be a universal religion. So you've got to give Paul some credit. Okay? Some and actually, if you think about it, a lot of credit. A lot of credit for lifting Christianity out of being a small, provincial, Jewish, Jewish sect into a universal faith. 
And that, ladies and gentlemen, for Paul's time and place, was progressive, was very inclusive, was very non-discriminatory for Paul's context and place where he lived. Now let's just look at that for a minute. If you ask Paul to be inclusive of all races, Paul probably wouldn't have a problem with that. Because his society didn't have a problem with races, it had a problem with nationalities and familial separations. If you ask Paul to be inclusive of women, he would short circuit up here. <laughs> because it simply wasn't imaginable on his part. Women were what? Property. They just simply weren't part of the picture of equal rights. It wasn't in his imagination that you considered equal rights for women. It would be like asking Paul, what do you prefer, a Chevy or a Ford, Paul? He would short circuit. It's not in his imagination that there were cars in the world. He couldn't conceive of it. If you asked Paul, should we be inclusive of gay and lesbian people? Short circuit. Not in his imagination. The word homosexuality wasn't invented until the mid-19th century. He didn't even know the word. The word sexuality wasn't invented until about the third into the 19th century. Sexuality. Sexuality wasn't even considered an issue during Paul. If you asked him about homosexuality, uh, what do you, what? He wouldn't know what you're talking about. It's not fair to say that he wasn't inclusive about those things when it was not in his context to understand them. If you asked him, Paul, what's on the other side of the ocean? You, what? Not in his context of thinking. Paul, what's on the other side of the moon? <laughs> not in his thinking. Why would you ask him to consider things that aren't in his thinking? Actually, it's the same thing about Jesus. He's silent on these things because it's not in his context of reference. What was in Paul's context of reference? Think about him for a minute. Remember Paul for a minute. Remember that Paul was a latecomer to Christianity. He wasn't one of the first disciples. He wasn't a disciple. He was a latecomer apostle. He appointed himself to be an apostle. He appointed himself. <laughs> All right, why did he appoint himself to be an apostle? Because he had this wonderful story of being converted to be, to be a Christian. Remember, he used to what with Christianity? He used to persecute them. He used his intelligence and his wit and his ability and his articulation to persecute Christians. <laughs> He'd round them up and send them into prisons and to, to death and to crucifixions and to all sorts of other things that the Romans did. That Paul did that. And he used his intelligence to do that. Somewhere along the line, he was converted away from that into being an advocate for Christianity. That's an incredible conversion. That's a 180 degree change. 
do we give him any credit for that? Do we go at a boy, Paul? Ever? Do we? He became the greatest church builder of the first century. Do we give him any credit for that? Well, let's look at what he did for Christianity after his conversion. He looked at Christianity, and it's a lot to do with this scripture reading that we read this morning, and said if Christianity is going to be anything like a New Testament or a new religion or something different than we've got already, then it has to be universal. It has to reach out beyond its provincial groundings into the rest of the world. We have to include the Gentiles. Now, when Paul did that, that was radically, and I mean radically, progressive. That was enormously, grossly progressive, inclusive. That was beyond the imagination of everybody else's context. To say that you would include Gentiles into this religion that everybody else thought was just going to be a, another faction of Judaism. That's incredible. And that you have to look at Paul and say, wow, that's big. Nobody did that before. Nobody could do that before. And listen to what he says. This is grounded in love, but brings you to the depth and length and height and depth of the power of God. It brings you to your experience in life, and yet it surpasses the knowledge of God. It brings you to the fullness of God and God's own. Abundance, abundant ability. He's talking about the fullness of human experience. This is talking about the human experience of this faith. It's not talking about the law, tradition, or ritual, or practices, or a book, or anything else that defined religion. It's talking about your human experience of your relationship to God, and that has nothing to do with whether or not you were Jewish or Gentile. And I think now if you asked Paul, if Paul was sitting here, and you made the cross from Jewish to Gentile, we would say, D -d does it include women and gays and lesbians and anything else you can name in that whole spectrum? And you go, well, duh. If he can put Gentiles in that group, duh. I think you can give Paul a break. Because in the words of our friend Donald Trump, <laughs> this is huge. <laughs> I don't know that that gives it any credibility, but it's a fun word to say these days. <laughs> this is one of the biggest things and one of the things that I like that John Poole often says is he says, this is what makes me want to be Christian. 
This is what makes me want to be Christian. That if God isn't a universal God, then God really isn't God. If Christianity isn't a, isn't a universal faith, then I don't want to be part of a little provincial group of people. If Christianity isn't pervasive love that's inclusive for all people, and I mean all with a capital A, then I don't know if that's the kind of love that I want to be a part of because I think love is for everybody, everybody, I mean everybody, with a capital E. So what Paul did is enormously important for our faith. And it makes us be the kind of church that this church is. It makes us the kind of people that we claim to be. It makes us say, wherever you are on the journey of faith, you're welcome here. If it weren't for Paul, we couldn't say that. We'd have to say, well, if you're on the journey of faith to our family, you can come to our family. This is so important that I think you can see it illustrated in our society recently. <laughs> and I love to have it shown in the headlines. When the Supreme Court made its decision on equal marriage, you saw all the headlines that said, love wins. I just got a kick out of that because our right-wing friends like to say that this country is based on uh, the Judeo-Christian uh, principles, right? And so that this is a Christian nation. And they want to say, this is a Christian nation and all the yada, yada, yada. They want to say all that kind of stuff, right? Well, love wins. I think they're right. Because if Christianity is universal, then love is universal. And if it influenced the Supreme Court to make marriage equality universal, then love wins. And so I think this whole thing that's influencing our country is part of the foundation of our country. And yeah, maybe. Not that I agree with the right wing, but the joke's on them. Love wins. And if you look at the latest deal we made with Iran, where you can see that maybe some hardline people decided that nuclear weapons and the threatening of nuclear weapons is not the way to go, but maybe peace is a better way to go then maybe love wins again. And if love is winning in the world, if peace is winning in the world, then that's the kind of love and peace that Paul is talking about here. When we are grounded in love, yet we can reach to the breadth and length and height and depth that surpasses all knowledge and knows the fullness of God and God's abundant power. We can go from here to there, and to there, and to here, and to there. We can do all of that far beyond we can ever imagine because of this love that we know in Jesus Christ. And because of that, love wins. Amen.
logo, this isn't very much. It's only a small part of what we earn and spend. But receive it as a symbol. Let it be a sign between you and us that we want to find and create the life and love that you offer. We are ready to be your people. Amen. Amen. Our Father, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen.